I served an unapproachable God. While I, I served the high priest that served an unapproachable God. But everything changed in that one night. Everything changed in one night. I was drugged to the garden and then my ear. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up. I was there in the garden with Judas. Judas knew exactly where Jesus was going to be and we were all there waiting for him. It was crazy that night. His disciples were with him, but I saw Jesus. I, I was very close to Jesus and you could tell he was visibly upset. And uh, Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek and I was standing so close that I heard Jesus call Judas friend. And that's the last thing I heard, because then moments later I heard nothing. I, I saw the flash of a blade come toward my face and, and I felt blood streaming down. And then it got quiet. And then I got dizzy. And then Jesus, he, he touched me. Like I said, I heard all the stories about Jesus, and I've heard all the stories about how Jesus healed people with his hands. There was this one time he, he healed a person with, with dirt and spit. And so many people, he just healed them with his hands, but it wasn't his hands for me. It was the way he looked at me. It was his eyes. That's what broke me. His eyes were filled with compassion and grief and joy. And, and, when he, and when he pulled his hand away, my ear, I mean, that night, everything I heard about that man had changed forever. They had a mock trial for him. Um, the whole night was just set up to condemn him. And he didn't say a word. He, he just felt sorry for us. There was the sentencing, there was, there was Pilate, uh, the crucifixion, and then there was an earthquake. And then the veil. I was in the temple. I was in the temple when the veil was, was ripped in half. Do you know what that means? I mean, even, even I knew what that meant. God had invited us all in. The unapproachable God was now approachable. God was on the move. Today, we're looking at the encounters with Christ. Encounters with Christ. And I think there's no more fitting way to start the series than to encounter Christ. So let's, uh, let's pray before we look into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you and praise you and thank you. You are the way maker. You are a miracle worker. You are light in the darkness. God, you are our every hope. And Lord, as we, as we prepare to look into your word this morning, we, we uh, lift it up and we look into your word, God, because we know it is life-changing. It transforms hearts. Your word renews minds. Your word speaks truth to us in ways that, that can change us. And so I pray, God, that you would open every, every uh, set of eyes and set of ears this morning, open every heart, that we would receive what you have for us on this day. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, um, turn to ch John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. John 18, verses 1 through 11. The disciple writes this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus, often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And in that moment um, of confrontation, when, when that occurred, something dramatic occurred. Something dramatic occurred after that. Luke provides more details. Uh, In Luke 22, verses 49 to 53, he fills in the blanks. He says this, And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers, the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. And in so doing, and in declaring that this is the power of darkness and this is your hour, Jesus was, in effect, granting permission for them to arrest him and also establishing his authority in all circumstances, including those circumstances leading to his own death. The truth is, we don't know what happened to Malchus after Jesus healed his ear. The Bible never mentions him again. But what we do know, what we do know is that Jesus knew exactly what was going on. You see a mixture of military soldiers and officers uh, of the chief priests gathered together and came as enemies of Jesus for the sole purpose of taking him captive and leading him to his ultimate death. Not because he did anything wrong, but because the people in power were threatened by him. And Malchus was clearly one of those leading the way because he was front and center when Jesus was confronted. So I'd like to, for a moment, to suppose we've never heard this story before. Let's suppose we know everything we do know about Jesus, whatever you happen to know about him, whatever you've learned about him, whatever you've been taught about him, but you've never heard this story before. Because here's the thing, Jesus regularly spoke truth to power. It's who he was. He regularly called out the Pharisees for for their hypocrisy. Earlier that same week, he had gone into the temple and and tipped over tables because of the corruption in his father's house. He wasn't afraid of conflict. So when Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, isn't it possible that Jesus could have rebuked Peter, told him to put his sword back in his sheath, saying, no more of this, but then turn to Malchus and say, Be thankful that wasn't your head that got cut off because, and may that wound remind you of what you have done to the Son of God. You know, I think if he had done that, if he had just changed the script and said, just be thankful that wasn't your head and not healed him, I don't think anyone would have thought the lesser of Jesus for it. God is a God of justice, right? He's a God of justice. And certainly that gang who came to apprehend Jesus for no reason other than the leaders being threatened deserved that and worse. Luke never tells us why Jesus healed Malchus, but examining Jesus' life, it's obvious why. It's because he loved them. It's because he loved them. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't say, well, you're lucky it was your ear. He looked into his eyes with love, touched his ear, 
and he healed them. He healed his enemy. Matthew 5.44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Those are the words of Jesus. The one thing I notice about Jesus as I read the Gospels, he does a pretty good job of living out what he tells us to do, doesn't he? He's pretty darn good at that. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Malchus showed up to capture Jesus, and Jesus didn't resist him, and he didn't rebuke him. He healed him. He healed him. This passage, to me, is an incredible example of both Jesus' love and his power. You know, as we read the Gospels, we, we come to the conclusion that Jesus is the perfect example of, of truth and grace. In fact, he's described as being full of truth and full of grace. And while we don't know that Malchus was really in the temple as the, as the, video, as the video described, we do know the overarching truth that was being told in the video, and that because it is true that Jesus went to the cross, and because he did, the veil in the temple was torn in two. The unapproachable God is now approachable by anyone. Sin-stained people can come into the presence of God and be restored and forgiven because of what Jesus has done. The unapproachable God is now approachable and God was and remains today on the move because he is here not for the people not for us not for the people who have already put our faith in him for the people who haven't yet he is on the move to reach people who desperately need to know about the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and he is on the move to reach them and the truth is we all meet Jesus in different circumstances many of us meet Jesus when we hit rock bottom some of us meet Jesus in our home or our church when we're growing up. Some of us meet Jesus when we cry out for help in breaking an addiction. Some of us meet Jesus through grief or depression or some other, or the depth of some other kind of pain. Some, some are touched by the Holy Spirit and respond to an altar call when a pastor talks about coming and putting your faith in Christ. Some meet Jesus because a loving friend introduced them to Jesus and said, here's how you can know God personally. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus when a burst of sun, a burst of light, stunning light beyond the sun, uh, poured upon him. A sinful woman met Jesus at a well. A leper met Jesus at the foot of a mountain. I met Jesus sitting on my bed in the deepest pain of my life. But Malchus, Malchus met Jesus when he came to arrest him. The actor who played Malchus in the video said everything changed after one night. What we can know for sure is that one cannot truly encounter Jesus and remain the same. And that's something we have to cement in our hearts. One cannot truly encounter Jesus and remain the same. And that means every time we open up his word and spend five or ten minutes in the word, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to encounter Jesus. And when we open the word, and we, 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 that should be our aim, we shouldn't leave that table or that chair until we've encountered him. Because if we do, that means we didn't spend enough time to encounter him. Because if we do, we'll be changed. Maybe just a little bit, maybe a lot. But we can't encounter Jesus without being changed. We can't encounter Jesus and remain the same. When we lift our hands up and worship and worship him, we should be changed after that song. And when, we, when we pray, we can walk away from that time of prayer changed. Sometimes we don't feel it, but you can know in faith it's true because you have just encountered the God of the universe. Because we're talking here about the king of kings. We're talking about when we enter into that area that used to be reserved for that priest one time a year and we get into presence, we are in the presence of God Almighty. We're in the presence of the great I Am. His name is power. His name is healing. His name is life. We sang it. Now we've just got to believe it. Because it's true. It's who he is. And he simply touched the ear of Malchus, and Malchus was healed. And when we think of this story, that's what we think of, right? 
We think of, of Jesus touching the ear, of course, because it was a miracle. But as I studied this story over the last couple of weeks, you know what jumped out at me? Another part of it jumped out at me. And I'm going to read that little section that jumped out at me as I've been preparing for this message. John 18, 4 through 6 jumped out at me. It says this, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And then it says, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You understand the power of God. They fell to the ground. Now, I've seen estimates from scholars and, and, and biblical commentators that say there may have been up more than 200 people that showed up to apprehend Jesus. I always picture this little group, okay, come with us, Jesus. I've read that there could have been up to 200 or even more people showing up in that crowd. And when Jesus said, I am he, they went sprawling on the ground. His power is something you and I can't even comprehend. Jesus made it clear to both those who were with him and those who came to arrest him that exactly who is control on this night and who is in control always. He was allowing, in fact, he was beyond allowing them to arrest him. He was dictating it. Because what happened when they were all sprawled on the ground? He said in John 18, 7 and 8, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? I can just picture he's on the ground. They're saying, let's, let's, let's get on with this guy. You came all tough with all your weapons to take me in? Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. Of course, he wanted, to, he wanted to protect the disciples, and that was part of what he wanted to do, but he was also letting them know this wasn't going to be a fight. He said, let's get on with this. Of course, Peter did his impulsive thing and cut off the ear of Malchus. But once again, what did Jesus do? He took control of the situation by rebuking Peter, and all of them saying no more of this and reaching out and touching and healing Malchus. In other words, Jesus never stopped being Jesus. Circumstances never mattered. Jesus never stopped being Jesus. And I would suggest to you, no matter what our circumstances are, that we never stop being Jesus' followers. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter what's happening out here. What matters is what's happening in here. And through faith in him, he will walk us through all situations we ever face. Jesus never stopped being Jesus, and he still hasn't stopped being Jesus today. He is power. And, and even when the person in front of him was his enemy, he reached out, loved him, and healed him because that's who Jesus is. And, and you know, there's so many times in Scripture that when we see the most humble moments of Jesus, the most restraint, the meekness, and, and meekness, by the way, isn't weakness. It's power under control. Meekness means he is powerful, but he's controlling it. And in his meekest moments, often it's accompanied by pure supernatural power right next to it. 19th century commentator Alexander McLaren made this point. He said this, Wherever in our Lord's life any incident indicates more emphatically than usual the lowliness of his humiliation, there, by the side of it, you get something that indicates the majesty of his glory. Jesus was born as a humble baby, yet announced by the angels. Jesus was laid into a manger, yet signaled by a star in the sky. Jesus submitted to baptism as if he was a sinner, then heard the divine voice of approval saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus slept when he was exhausted, but awoke and calmed the storm. Jesus wept at a grave, wept because his friend had died, and then he raised him to life. Jesus surrendered to arrest, but along the way, he said, I am, I am, and it knocked all the troops down. Jesus died on the cross, but in it, he defeated sin and death. Jesus allowed himself to be put in the tomb, but he burst out of it in glory, and he lives today. 
and he is our hope, and he is the hope for this world. None of that, none of that power has changed, none of it. And what you and I simply can't afford to miss is this is the same God we pray to. It's the same God that we try to connect with and, and allow to walk us through our, through our life. That same God that healed Melchus is the God that we're asking and that will heal our beloved Jan Jensen, who's with us today. I pictured you at home. She's here. She's here. But, but it's that same God that's going to heal her and everybody on our prayer list. He's the same God who did miracles then, will today. The same God whose power knocked over all those soldiers when they came to arrest him is the God that knocked down every barrier when we prayed almost two years for our new Jerusalem that brought us here for the birth of Rise MKE. A lot had to happen for this to happen. Amen? Amen? And he did it all. He did it all. That same God who defeated sin and death with his sacrifice on the cross and his glory of his resurrection is the God we trust every single day. He's the God this world needs, and he's the God that we're telling them about. We need to press on. It's too important. The God who says in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that sound great? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when we do that, and when we put our faith in him and in Christ alone, what does he do? When, when someone says yes to Jesus Christ, what happens? He slays the power of sin in our life. He thrashes Satan and he removes us from him. He washes us with grace and forgiveness and, and until we are white as snow. He assures us that we are redeemed and restored and forgiven and accepted. He assures us that we are loved. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will be ours forever and we will be his forever. He assures us that we never, ever have to be afraid again because our future is heaven and our presence will always be spent with him. How much better could it get? How much better could it possibly get? When Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in that temple tore, opening the way to a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The unapproachable God is now approachable. And he equips us through his power, he equips us. The Bible talks about, you know, what the world doesn't like talking about, but the Bible talks about is that there's demons, there's, there's a spiritual war going on, an invisible spiritual war. And in dealing with spiritual war, the great I am is who gives us the power to face the demons, the true enemies of our life. And the great I am gives us the power in Jesus' name to defeat them. We don't need to be afraid and we don't need to be obsessed with them. We've got the power over them through Jesus Christ. They are our real enemies. It's the, it's, the, it's the invisible enemy that's our real enemies, not people. In dealing with human beings, the great I am gives us the power to love our enemies, even heal our enemies, because they aren't our enemies at all. Even the people that hurt us, the people that offend us, the people that are wounded. You know, wounded people wound people. We've all heard it. Sometimes we get wounded by that. God calls us to forgive because he says, I have forgiven you of everything and lifted you to a future you don't deserve. So here's what I'm going to ask you. Forgive them. They're broken. I died for them too. Let it go. Forgive them. They're not your enemy. That's what Jesus tells us. Whoever that person is that you are holding something against this morning is not your enemy. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The enemy is the enemy. <laughs> People are not our enemy. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward as we wrap up this morning. The God who knocked down an entire band of soldiers and Pharisees and, and workers of the chief priests, he's the God who is with us every moment of every day. We call him the great I am, because when he said I am, it knocked people over. The great I am is the God we worship, and he is worthy. And the greatest miracle of all, 
through the cross of Jesus Christ, the curtain is torn, and imperfect people, sinful people, people like us who mess up, have a place to go to get forgiven and redeemed and restored. And a future is held for us in heaven. We get to spend eternity with God. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. He is good. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God Almighty, you are the great I am. And we worship you. And we praise you. And we thank you. Oh, God, I pray that for each and every one of us, you would revive in our hearts a sense of reverence and worship as we stand before the great I am. I pray that we would live for you. I pray that we would sacrifice for you. I pray that we would make our mission letting other people know about you so they can experience your grace and goodness and and the power in their lives. I pray, God, that you would help us, Father, to glorify you with all we do. You are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, and you are the great I am. And we pray it all in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen.